Good morning, church. How's everyone this morning? Good morning. Wow, really? We can do better than that. Good morning, church. How's everyone this morning? Good morning. Awesome, awesome. Well, if you're watching online this morning, let us know in the comments that you're with us here this morning. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful time in Advent today. This is the third week in Advent, and so uh, today we'll be lighting the hope candle as well, so uh, we look forward to that. This December 1st, uh, we started a new, um, a new, I guess we're going to call it an annual event, so uh, we read one chapter in Luke each day, and then that, by the time we uh, get up to the 24th, of December, we've re read the entire book of Luke, and that gives us the full story of Jesus and tells us why the nativity is so important. So we look forward to that. If you haven't uh, been able to do that, Terry made some really neat little blue bookmarks in the back back there. You can kind of check off where you're at. So if you need to do some catch up, you can binge on it. it won't take you that long, uh, but. Uh, uh, it's a really, really good experience if you go through that. Lori and I do it uh, before we get out of bed in the morning. First thing we do is I, I reach over and I have my Bible app on my phone, and I tell it to read it to us. And so it just reads the whole chapter to us, stops at the end of the chapter, and we're ready for the next day. So it's really cool that way. And then this Wednesday, we're going to have Why the Nativity. Uh, we're going to continue on with our series in that. And uh, that Bible study that we're doing is we kind of do the, a little bit of a deeper dive into uh, what we talked about on Sunday in our messages and the reasons why. Why did Jesus become a man? Why Joseph? This week we're doing why Mary? And then next week, why call him Savior? And more information on this can be found at our Grace Street Church, Why the Nativity link, and it'll take you right through it. And then... Next Sunday, we have a double header. So we have church in the morning on our normally scheduled times. And then we'll be having our Christmas Eve candlelight service at 8 p.m. So uh, join us. It's, it's really cool when this whole place is dark outside and we have just the lights on in here and the candles that are going. It's a great, great, great experience. And it's a, a very awesome time for us to just kind of center ourselves on the reason for the season and looking forward then to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Following up the Saturday after that then is our next men's breakfast, which will be January 6th at 9 a.m. And so we have a lot of good food fellowship. Uh, we always have a, a we, we end up talking about cars a lot, I think, uh, and things like that. But it's, it's just a good time for us to fellowship together, have a good time. And then we always do a devotion, and uh, so that men's breakfast then at 9 a.m. Then following up that that evening, uh, January 6th, we're going to be showing the Bridge to Terabithia, and that is uh, an awesome movie. It talks about some preteens that are that are going through some struggles in life, family struggles, struggles in school, bullying, and things like that and to try and escape all the stuff that they're having to go through in life already at that age, they come up with a Terabithia, which is this dream kingdom that they, that they get to rule over. And it's an awesome, awesome way to heal themselves through the process. It's a very, very good movie, so I highly, highly, highly suggest that you come and see the movie because it's, it's very well worth it. So as we uh, come through that, uh, we're then we'll be one month out from starting the 19th season of Orange Track Racing. 19 years, man. So we look forward to that in February. We follow NASCAR for those of you who don't know, so follows the NASCAR season February through November. So well, let's, uh, let's enter this time of worship and prayer to God. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank, praise you and thank you for this day. We thank you for another day in your presence and another day of life, Lord. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and the sacrifice that he made for us on the cross. Lord, we confess today that we are sinners and we're in need of your grace and mercy today. 
We repent of our sins today and we open our hearts to you to invite you in to be our Lord and Savior today. Lord, we, we pray that by the power and the blood and the love of Jesus that we can be redeemed and we can be saved and we can be made whole again in you and through you, Lord. In your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Terry, this morning is uh, chosen for the call to worship Luke 2, 26. Wait a minute. Luke 1. <coughs> okay. <laughs> I was going to say that's Luke 1, by the way. Luke 1, 26 through 28. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. See, that angel carried God's message specifically to chosen individuals. So God would send angels down when he had something he really needed their attention on and really wanted to have their attention. And so he sends the angels down, and they didn't simply repeat the message. It was like a whole experience. And if we watch the Why the Nativity scene in there, we know that when that angel came down, you know, the lights were there, and the whole sky lit up and everything, and it's an experience. So he didn't just send them down to talk to them. He wanted this to be an experience for them so they knew that they were in the presence of God, and this was God's message for them. So they engaged people in conversation with God, and he sends the angels to bring a message of grace to the people. Grace out of his grace to the people, to Mary. And God selected Mary to become the mother of Jesus. God's grace, his unmerited favor was put upon Mary. And that is how she carried the Savior of the world to the world. And his blessing of grace is given without any regard whatsoever of that person being worthy to receive that grace. That same grace that he extends to us isn't because we've done everything right in our lives. It's kind of just the opposite. We need that grace and we need that mercy because, hey, we mess up all the time. I don't care who you are, you're guilty. I am. So God selected Mary to become the mother of Jesus and this unmerited favor and this blessing comes upon her. Virtually all of God's relationships to us are expressions then of his grace to us in one way or another. Grace or love is at the very heart of each experience that we have with God. And that is part of God's very existence with man, his grace and mercy and love. Out of that then flows what we come in the Advent series to celebrate, which is peace and joy and love grace, an expression of love never ending in his son Jesus, which is our center candle here. And so during our Advent period here, we look at this and we, we see the writer Luke and he emphasized the grace of God throughout the chapter. So as we're reading this whole book of Luke through these 24 days, we see God's grace extended again and again and again. On top of that, he tells us about God's love, and he shows us through the writings how God fulfilled his promises through his grace of love. His messengers, the angel, appear many times to bring hope and joy and peace when people needed it the most. And this was the case with Mary and Joseph, as we heard from last week's message. They brought in, and what he gave them made a huge difference in the experiences of their lives. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, now we're going to have the lighting of the Advent candles. So if you guys would come forward, you should be all set. All right. <laughs> well, good morning, family. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this day of Advent, wow. Um, the reading comes from Luke 2, 10 through 11, and it's the ESV translation. It reads, the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news 
and great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born the day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The shepherds here, the angels proclaim, and indeed are filled with both awe and joy. They are mere shepherds, considered by some as the lowest of low. But the angels come to them, no one else but to them, and gives them the news of momentous event, the birth of the Messiah. Filled with joy that they can, can run down the hills unto the town. Find the stable and manger, and kneel before the Christ child. Joy is emotion and exaltation that comes from new revelation, an event of blessing, a state of blessedness, and surely the shepherds feel that. But as the years progress and they tell the story of the, to their children's children, the sense of wonder and joy remain, and angel has spoken to them. The angel spoke of a physical birth, but there is also a spiritual dimension. The joy that breaks upon us when we finally guess that Jesus loves us in the spite of ourselves. Forgiveness of all sins and past feeling and takes up residence in our lives. Then the initial joy meditates onto an enduring joy of champions, championship of the Lord. And with the light of these candles, let's go to prayer. Father, thank you for the joy the angels experience, the joy of Jesus' birth, and the joy of the new birth that we can experience day by day until we see your glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for doing that this morning. Joy. <coughs> Unspeakable joy. I have joy this weekend because my kids are here. My kids are here. All of them. And the grandkids. <laughs> and all their own readers. <laughs> we'll see if anybody runs up like they have in the back. <laughs> this morning's message is uh, a continuation of our series, Why the Nativity? Why Mary? Out of all the women that God could have chosen, why Mary? Jesus' mother, Mary, is the most and best known female in the Bible. And it's been like that for over two centuries. Luke 128 says, Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. God, just like he has predetermined a path for each of us, had determined her path even before she was in the womb of her mother. And just like all of us, every person in the Bible has their own story. And just like all of us, we can learn from those stories. What we learn from them is about their walk with God. That's the way God chose to have his scriptures written. And the question is, is this what people are learning from your story? What do people learn from you? We can learn a lot from Mary. And this morning we're going to cover three different characteristics of godliness from her life. First, Mary teaches us the submission of godliness. There we go. Is that a little better? I, I can still hear that little bit of clinking in there, but. See, I just should have asked the sound guy. And then I would have known what was wrong. Gifts. 
So Mary teaches us about submission of godliness. From the very beginning of her relationship with Jesus, it was all about submission. So we go back to when the angel Gabriel came to Mary with the news that she was to be the mother of the Messiah. Yeah. I can still hear that. I don't know what that is. As the mother of the Messiah, Mary had absolutely no warning. She had no preparation, no timeline of how things were going to play out. And there was absolutely no precedent to this. Gabriel came with God's words and changed Mary's life when he told her that she would bear a son. She was told that his birth would be unlike any other child ever born. To that point and since, no other child would be born like she was to have a child without having a relationship with a man, even though she was betrothed to, to Joseph. And he would be a child of the Holy Spirit. Listen to how Mary responded to the news that she was to be the mother of the Messiah and see how this response to this news changed her life. Luke 138 says, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. In other words, she probably was could have said it this way. Lord, I don't understand it. I don't comprehend it. But whatever you want, whatever you desire, I accept it according to your word. Now Mary had to have wondered in her heart, why me? Why have I been favored to be the mother of Jesus? We don't know the reasons. Scriptures don't tell us the reasons. Only God knows. And you know, we find that a lot in the scriptures. God tells us a little bit, but he doesn't give us everything. He's got a reason for that. And it is for his perfect purpose. Now, it's clear from studying Mary's life with the little information that we do have that she was not some random selection. Granted, she was just a, and this sounds like a song, she was just an ordinary small town girl whom God knew would be the obedient and courageous woman that she would become. From her son, we learned that she was a woman of scripture and of faith. She was a virgin so that, the God, so that God's glory would be miraculously shown. She was a peasant in keeping with the humble nature of the Lord's birth. Mary was every one of those things and more. Now, she honored and obeyed the will of the Father by providing his only son, Jesus, a home, a life. She took care of him. From that home, he would emerge to launch the work that would define all of human history. Not just going forward, but taking the Old Testament and making it real, bringing it to life. Now, as a child, just as like I watched our grandkid, he probably walked either beside or behind Mary. But as an adult, over time, it would be Mary that would walk behind him and follow him. In fact, she walked behind him all the way to the cross and then all the way to the tomb. Mary teaches us the submission of godliness. There comes a time when God will ask each and every one of you to do something and we need to obey. The question, or should I say the dilemma is, will we be like Mary and accept and obey that call? 
when God asks us to do something that may be hard or that we do not understand, we need to rise up in obedience as Mary did. I mean, come on. He said, you're going to bear a son. How much more could he ask of us? Are you fighting with something that God is asking you to do? Been there, done that. Wrestled and lost. Called the ministry at 14 and yeah, it was a little longer before I actually listened. <clears throat> we have to let Mary's example guide us. Let her words be our words. So let me ask you to go back and learn the submission of godliness from Mary and let her words be these for you. I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Next up, Mary teaches us the surprise of godliness. Mary teaches us not only the submission, but also that there are surprises that go along with it. The greatest adventure you will ever know here on earth is not traipsing through the mountains, climbing the top of the Himalayas, scuba diving in the ocean, it's the adventure of walking with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is, until we get to heaven, where it will be even better. How does it feel to know that you are related to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? How does it feel to know that the creator of the universe sent his son to live within your life? How does it feel to know that you have a direction, or excuse me, a direct line of communication with the Almighty God? We just pray. Now, some of us can still get down on our knees. We might not be able to get back up, but some of us can't. We have to sit. Some of us stand. We can pray and have that direct line of communication all day long, whether we're kneeling, whether we're lying down, sitting, standing, walking, running. You can talk to God through each and every part of your day. How incredible is it to know that you can have fellowship with him and that he will direct, guide, strengthen, and be with you through each and everything you go through. That is is truly a great adventure. But it's also a great adventure that is full of surprises. Because you start down the path, you don't know what surprise is going to come up next. I was talking to my son-in-law yesterday. He was telling me about just coming out of the insurance agent's office for the damage that had been done in his car while he was at work. And he watched a lady back into his fender. Not this far from the part that's broken on the back of the, on the bumper. Oh, surprise, surprise, he did get the license plate. Surprise, surprise, it's a fake plate. Surprise. But through it all, God is good. He's going to get it all fixed. And they have, it's not damaged to the point where they can't have safe travel. So thank God for that. He didn't know he was going to be an example this morning. <laughs> of course, I didn't until just then either, so surprise. <laughs> when we walk with the Lord, God's word doesn't always give you the information that you need or that you want about the future. Either two minutes ahead of time or two weeks or two months or two years. We don't always have the information about the future. It's kind of a, oh, as the military likes to say, it's a need to know basis. God knows and you don't get. That's the way it was with Mary. Mary's entire relationship with Jesus was a relationship of surprises. From being in diapers, <laughs> to maybe falling and getting hurt all the way through his adolescence and into adulthood and then into his ministry and it was all a relationship of surprises. 
when Gabriel made his startling announcement to Mary concerning the birth of Jesus, here's how she first responded. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Luke 129. Now, Mary had no preparation for this assignment. You know, you're in school, teacher, professor, whatever, they give you some things to read to prepare for the assignment, to prepare for the test. That didn't happen. God surprised her with his message and his plan for her life. And when the shepherds told Mary and Joseph that what the angel had said about Jesus' birth, she became quietly contemplative. As parents, you can think about that. You hear things about your kids and you become, you don't always talk about it out loud, you just come become quietly contemplative. Luke 2, 18 and 19 says, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them, but Mary, treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Think about your own kids, if you have kids, if you're a parent, and the things that you treasure up in your heart from your past. I see my daughter doesn't know she's going to be an example, and I didn't know this is a surprise to me too. Yesterday I handed her this little yellow bear with it. It was a little plastic frame. This thing was from the 80s. It was... A little picture of her when she was a baby. It was my mom's. And I had found it going through stuff. And I gave it to her. And surprise, surprise, my granddaughter likes it even better than mom does. <laughs> so now it's hers. We treasure up all these things. I saw that picture and all those things that I had treasured in my heart when she was that age came pouring. Just like we do, Mary collected all these truths and stored them deep in her heart. She would treasure them all her life. Have you ever had a moment when God spoke to you where something happens that you can't explain? It causes you to pause and wonder and to think. What did God just say? You want me to do what? But like Mary, we often find ourselves surprised on that walk. And like Mary, we don't have a blueprint for our lives. Each day is something new and something definitely different. There's no, and I know you guys now know this, but there's no manual that came with the kids. And each one is very different. I guess there's the little princess over there. She knows that she's falling asleep, so that's, that's right. We need to submit to the Lord by faith. When we do that, we will always find that he is right there with us. He hears our prayers. He meets our needs. So what's next? Well, Mary teaches us the suffering of God. And the surprise that goes along with that, too. Right now, we need to pause from the joy and gladness of Christmas. That's kind of an odd thing to say. But let's pause from that a minute. Because in order to understand the full meaning behind the Christmas story, we have to look at some other things that go hand in hand with that. We need to remember that Christmas is only meaningful in light of the fact that it is the beginning and not the end. Christmas by itself is a beautiful story, but it's not the whole story. For that, we have to put Christmas together with Easter. And that doesn't mean you just come on Christmas and come on Easter and be called by pastors a CE Christian. Christmas and Easter. But we have to put them together because they go together. It's a very important. When we do this, we realize that the cradle and the grave have a direct line drawn between them. It is then that Christmas becomes a more profound and more meaningful event. 
As Mary teaches us the suffering of God in us, we move from the announcement of his birth to the agony of his death. There would be no reason for the cradle if it weren't for the cross. And there would be no reason for the cross if it weren't for the cradle. They have to go together. The transition from Jesus' birth to his death is a normal one and a natural one. He came to earth because he was born to die. Now, we all live a life. We're born and we do die. That's just the natural course of things. Brought apart because of the fall, because of the fruit being eaten. But he was actually born to die. Jesus made seven distinct statements from the cross in his dying hour before he gave up his spirit to the Father. Those seven statements are found in all the Gospels. So we're going to go through each of these. The first word from the cross is in Luke 23, 34. This is from the New Century Version. It says this, Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. That is a prayer for God to forgive those who were crucifying Jesus. The second is from Luke 23, 43. And Jesus replied, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. Now that's a word of forgiveness to the repentant thief who is hanging next to Jesus. The fourth is from Matthew 27, 46. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's a word of resignation spoken from Jesus to the Father in heaven. The fifth word is from John 19, 28. and says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. The sixth word was from John 19, 30. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And the seventh word from Luke 23, 46. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into my hands, or into your hands, I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, who was listening intently and carefully and heard that I skipped from two to four? I did. Because the third one doesn't fit into each of these other six. But there's purpose behind it. So here's that third word from John 19, 26 and 27. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. In the last moments of his life here on earth, Jesus turned his thoughts away from the events on the cross, the things that were happening around him, the fact that he had been beaten to near death and then nailed to a cross. He turned his thoughts to be concerned with his mom. Now around the cross that day were many onlookers and bystanders, some of who were his disciples, many who weren't, including the Roman soldiers. Some said, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. He could have easily have done that, but it would not have fulfilled his reason to be born to die. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the Jews pointed their fingers at him and shouted, If you're the Christ, save yourself. But as John wrote and the other gospel writers wrote, some of Jesus' friends were also there. The gospels, if we take and kind of combine that list, tell us that Jesus' mother Mary was there. Mary, the wife of Clopas, was there. Salome was there. John's mother, Mary Magdalene, and John. 
And as I went through that, I saw that, hmm, three Marys. <coughs> That's interesting. It's kind of like a squirrel moment for me. But in one of his last moments, Jesus turns to John, who John, I, it just kills me how he writes in third person. <laughs> the disciple whom Jesus loved, writing about himself. There's a bit of humility there because he's not calling it out. But he was concerned about the well-being of his mother Mary. He wanted her to be taken care of. And scripture tells us that when they left the place of the crucifixion, John does take Mary to his own home. Honestly, it's got to be one of the most tender moments in all of the New Testament. Jesus' first three words from the cross were all about others. To those who were persecuting him, he said, Father, forgive them. To the criminal that was being crucified with him, he said, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. And to John, he said, Behold, your mother. The record concerning Mary and John is filled with insights about godliness that's translated into our culture and into our very homes. The way that parents were treated then is so different than it is today. And as we think back through the life of Jesus and his mother, we can identify with what they experienced. We can identify as Jesus as a baby, as, as a toddler growing up and becoming, eventually becoming a man. In fact, in the Christmas story, there is a little prophecy that makes us look toward the crucifixion. Remember when Jesus was taken to the temple by his parents shortly after he was born? And they saw Anna and Simeon. Luke 2, 34 and 35 from the New King James Version says it this way. Then Simeon blessed them. And he said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Then the Bible tells us that Simeon took Jesus in his arms and blessed God. Simeon had been waiting for the Messiah his entire life. He prophesies these words. He told Mary that her child would be the cause of much sorrow and much pain in her life. Definitely not something we wish from our kids. He spoke a word that would pierce her very soul. This prophecy was given 30 years before the crucifixion. It was fulfilled as Mary watched her son beaten and nailed to the cross. I dare say Mary knew more pain in her entire life than most of us will ever know. She knew about the godliness of suffering. The day Jesus was crucified, Mary experienced the fulfillment of Simeon's words and a sword pierced through her soul. James Stalker is a writer of New Testament truth, and he's written some wonderful books on the life of our Lord Jesus. Describing this moment in Mary's life, he wrote this, There Jesus hung before her eyes, but she was helpless. His wounds bled, but she dared not touch them. His mouth was parched, but she could not moisten it. The nails pierced her as well as him. The thorns round his brow were a circle of flame around her heart. Can you imagine your child? And there's nothing that you can do. The babe of Bethlehem. The boy of Nazareth. The brawny workman of the carpenter shop. The gentle man of Galilee the unequaled teacher, the man of merciful miracles, the 
humble man of patience and grace. Mary's own son was writhing before her own eyes in the throes of agony and death. He grew up just like our children grew up. Those memories of his early days, no doubt, were playing through her mind at that very moment. That was all a part of who she was. And she remembered them. The hands and feet that she had held when he was an infant were now nailed to a cross. The disciples would leave him. His friends would forsake him. The nations would reject him, but his mother was there to the very end. In these two snapshots of Mary, his death and birth, we're reminded that God wants us to learn from the people of the Bible. From Mary, we learn the submission of godliness, the surprise of it, and the lesson that none of us really want to learn, the suffering of it. It's all a part of life. We either embrace it and learn from it, or we can spend our entire existence here on this earth fighting against something that we can never overcome. Our Lord Jesus suffered. Mary suffered. We have experienced the suffering that comes with living. We had much to learn from Mary. <laughs> Here's a remarkable thing as it does relate to Mary. Mary was the mother of Jesus, as we know, but she needed Jesus to be her Savior as much as each and every one of us did. <clears throat> In the Magnificent, <clears throat> this truth is revealed when Mary said this, Luke 46 and 47 from chapter 1 of Luke. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. As fantastic as this is, the Savior who was born in Mary's womb had to be born again in her heart. She knew that. Jesus was born. She was the vessel. But then, he had to be born again in her heart. The Savior whose birth we celebrate during this season is a Savior who must be born in our hearts as well. He comes into our hearts from the outside. The question I have to ask you today is, have you invited Jesus to come into your heart and take up his residency within you. If you haven't, you don't know what you're missing. You're fighting against something that you can't win. But when you do invite him into your heart and you do allow him to take up residency, you do allow the Holy Spirit to work within you, then your life will be transformed in a way that you would never imagine. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, open our hearts and our minds to be guided by the Holy Spirit. Help us, as you did, Mary, to discern your calling on our lives. Lord, we are easily swayed by the ways of the world. Please don't let that weakness get in the way of your work in our lives. Continue to teach us all that we can do, or all that we can do to be more like your son, Jesus. Teach us to be godlier men and women. Teach us to submit to your will for our lives. Father, we know through the examples of the people of the Bible that not everything is laid out for us. We know that there will be surprises along the way. Teach us to submit to that, Father. Teach us to submit to those surprises and to work through them to bring you glory. <clears throat> and all too well, Father, we know that there will also be suffering along the way. We're not promised a free pass through all of that pain that comes with life here on earth. Thank you for the hope that you have given us through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Thank you that this hope can see us through all of life's trials and tribulations. It is my prayer this morning that no matter what we go through,
that we can be an example of that same hope to those around us. Father, let our soul magnify you and our spirit rejoice in our Savior. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, this time of communion this morning, we focus our hearts on Jesus. We focus our hearts on the message that he gave. We focus our hearts on the sacrifice that he made for us on the cross. As Terry said, he was born to die, rejected and alone. And that's exactly what happened. But it was much more than that. See, while he was with us on earth, he gave us an, ex an example, a living example of how to be a godly person, of how to live a godly life. <clears throat> and he taught us to be in communion with each other. That means to be joined together, to edify each other, to lift each other up through the problems, through the trials in our lives. So during this time of communion in here today, we need to focus on those things. Our ability to lift each other up, to join together. The act of communion brings us together in oneness with Christ. In oneness with his sacrifice that he made for us. And so as he was telling his disciples on the night that he was given up, he was bringing them into communion with himself. In the fact that he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. He took upon himself the sins of the world. Later on, he took a cup and he filled it and he blessed it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And so joining with us, he took upon the sins of the earth and washed us clean. body and the blood of Christ for you. For those of you who aren't familiar with our fancy new communion cups, the wafer's on the bottom side of the cup, so make sure you take that off first, otherwise you take a bath. <laughs> and then your wife gets to clean the shirts. The body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. Amen. And good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Now it's time for prayers for the people. And uh, if anyone would like to ask for prayer for anybody, I'm here to pray for somebody. So I have a few on the list this morning. Okay. <clears throat> well, Father God, we come to you today to share the blessings of worshiping together. It brings joy and peace to our troubled hearts. For your words are more precious than gold or silver. Your words lift our spirits when we are troubled. You give us light when we walk in darkness. Your words of your book give us light unto our path. Help us to always search for you. Help us all to invite your Holy Spirit to forever live in our hearts so that we will feel the presence of the living God in us daily as we walk on this earth. In Psalm 16, 7 and 8, it says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart entrusts me instructs me. I have set the Lord always before, uh, before me. Because he is my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, let the joy of the Lord be our strength. Father God, I lift up Diane to you this morning, for she is in need of special care, Father God. She needs your strength and your word to hold her, Lord Jesus. 
Keep her in complete comfort, Lord God. Give her strength each and every day. And Father God, if there's a special woman out there that has um, made these crosses, and Don gave this to me this morning, and she's in need of prayer, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this woman's life who, who honors you by making these crosses, Lord Jesus. I just pray for her this morning. I pray comfort and peace over her mind. I pray that um, she will open your word and read it, Lord God. And especially in Philippians 4, Lord Jesus, I feel that she needs to read this over and over to comfort her mind and heart. So be with her today and each and every day, Lord. Give her strength. Father, I would like to lift up my sister-in-law to you today, Patricia, who suffered a stroke last Monday. You alone know her inmost being. I lay her at your feet for healing. Let your will be done in her life, and we thank you for the blessing. Father God, I lift up all in our church and who are online today, all who are afflicted and suffering mentally or physically, we ask for your presence to be ever before us, to live in our hearts and dwell among us, so that our spirits, minds, and hearts will be renewed every morning. I ask for physical healing of our bodies, because you alone created each and every one of us. You alone can heal us. Let your will be done in our lives as we meditate upon your word. Let us always glorify your holy name, no matter what. As war rages in Israel and Gaza and the Ukraine and Russia, help us to remember that you are in control. Help us to pray for them. Let your will be done. Help us always to remember to help those in need as we are able. For this is what you have called us to do. Give us, give us wisdom to know the true purpose of our lives and to remember the reason why you came and why you created us. Help us to be a blessing to others. And remember, you are always with us. You will never leave us or forsake us. I lift up the homeless to you, Father God. We thank you for their lives. We thank you that you watch over them day and night. Please navigate them through each day. Please provide food, shelter, jobs, and to lift them up and off the streets, Lord Jesus. Give them a sense of purpose, hope, and joy for each new day. Father God, I lift up our children and grandchildren to you. Guide them, protect them, comfort them in their trials, that they will find the peace that only you can provide, the joy of living a godly life, and hope for each passing day. Father God, help us all to read your word, that we will feel your presence in our hearts always. In Psalms 51, 10 through 12, it states, Create in me a pure heart, O God and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Thank you, God the Father, God the Son. never ceases to me how amaze me is the things that I run across through the course of a day. I got up, got my coffee, read my normal devotional, read Luke 17, and then I got this little notification and I went out and I was reading it and it's uh, a guy that I follow, his name is Dave Adminson, he goes by Aussie Dave, he's from Australia, he's on Instagram, he's He's, he considers himself an internet pastor. He has a flock there in Australia, but um, he, he puts these stories out, and it fit. It says this, When the angels went to the shepherds the night Jesus was born, they told them that they would recognize the newborn Savior because he would be wrapped in swaddling clothes or strips of cloth. Now, here's... Here's the details, because we tend to gloss over the details, he says. Assuming the swaddling claws are like a diaper or like a blanket, right? 
But what if there is more to the details of Jesus' birth that points to his purpose, to God's purpose? During the Passover, the Holy Feast celebrated by Jews for thousands of years that happens around the time Christians are celebrating Easter, three pieces of matzah bread are presented at the start of the meal. The second piece is broken and wrapped in a linen cloth, and this piece is set aside for later in the ceremony. For followers of Jesus, we know he is the second piece of the Trinity, Father, Son, who was wrapped in cloth at his birth and would be wrapped in cloth again after his body was broken for us. And he was placed in a tomb during the Passover festival. It's interesting that the Hebrew word for wrapped in the Bible is chaffle, or I guess, excuse me, pronounced coffle, which means to tie down or to wrap up. When Jesus was sacrificed at Easter, he was tied down, and his body was wrapped up in cloths at his burial. This is a reminder to me that Jesus' birth has a purpose. Remember we said he was born to die. It's a reminder that Christmas points to Easter. As Pastor Tim Keller has put it, the world can't save itself. That is the message of Christmas. God is in the details of the story as much as he is in the details of your life. If any of you start singing that song, I'm right there with you. God is in the details. As we close out this time together this morning, I just ask you to remember that like Mary, we each have a purpose. God has a purpose for all of us. That may be, if you live in a some place where others also have an apartment or a house where you've got housemates or you go to you at your work or all these different places there's all these opportunities to invite others into that relationship to invite them to a place such as Grace Street Church things for movies or orange track or men's breakfast so many opportunities to come in in a non-threatening way because people often see worship as a little threatening so we offer open doors to other things. Father God, as we prepare to close out our online portion of our service, we thank you. We thank you that you chose Mary. We thank you that you chose us. We thank you that there is a call in our lives. Father, give us the courage to follow that call. Give us the strength to go through that. Father, we know there are going to be surprises and there's going to be suffering. But in and through it all, Father, we know that you are walking that path right beside us. Thank you for each and everything that you do for us throughout our lives. And Father, when it is our time to leave this earthly place, let people look back on our lives and see you. In Jesus' name.